first ever Creative Future Literary Awards just now, recognizing talented and marginalized writers from around the UK. Congratulations to all the winners. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our next two guests. Accomplished poet and broadcaster Lem Sisse released the first of many collections of poetry at 21. And since the age of 24, has been a full-time writer performing around the world. In 1995, he made the BBC documentary Internal Flight about his life. His 2005 drama Something Dark dealt with his search for his family and was adapted for BBC Radio 3 in 2006, winning the Commission for Racial Equalities Race in the Media Award. His television appearances include The South Bank Show and Grumpy Old Men. No comment. A radio broadcaster, Lem makes documentaries for the BBC as well as contributing to the BBC's book panel. In 2007, he was appointed artist in residence at London's South Bank Centre. He was the official poet of the London 2012 Olympics and has worked with British Council and is a patron of Book Trust Letterbox Club supporting children in care, as well as the reader organization. He was made an honorary doctor of letters by University of Huddersfield in 2009 and appointed an MBE in 2010. Multi-talented Ros Barber is author of verse novel The Marlowe Papers, which was long listed for the Women's Prize for Fiction. Joint winner of the Authors Club Best First Novel Award and winner of the Desmond Elliott Prize. She has also written three collections of poetry, the most recent of which, Material, was a Poetry Book Society recommendation. Roz is a visiting fellow at the University of Sussex and teaches the Creative Writing MA at Goldsmiths University, as well as undertaking numerous public art commissions and writing residencies. Her poems have been published in a wide range of anthologies including Faber's Poems of the Decade. Her short fiction has been published by Bloomsbury and Serpent's Tale, and her poems have appeared in The Guardian and Independent on Sunday. She is also author of a number of academic articles on Christopher Marlowe and on the Shakespeare authorship question, and is a founder member of the International Marlowe Shakespeare Society and an associate of the Shakespearean Authorship Trust. So without a moment, Pause. Please join me in welcoming Lem and Roz to take us through tonight's events. Thank you. As you can see, I'm not Lem. Thank you, Alistair. Uh, welcome again. I'm Dominique Delight, uh, the, one of the project directors of Creative Future. We develop and showcase uh, the work of marginalized artists and writers, and we do this for our artists through two national events, the Impact Art Fair and the Type Modern. Think of a miniature replica of the Tate Modern, sort of the size of the garden shed, stuffed full of art. And we thought it was about time we had an event to showcase the work of marginalized writers. We were overwhelmed of, by entries from across the UK, and we were very happy that Lem Sasse, um, who you've heard so much about from Alistair, has been on board with the project right from the very start, and I was very happy because I've been a fan of his for many, many years. We're also privileged to have Roth Barber speak tonight. There's a long list of people to thank, and I've very little time, so, and I don't want to bore you, so please see the anthology acknowledgements for a full <laughs> list of folk. <laughs> However, I just want to briefly mention, <laughs> briefly, the Arts Council and Brighton and Hove City Council for funding this activity. New Writing South, Myriad Editions, Kingston University Press, and Self, Self, Self for being great project partners. The, all the seven judges that were involved, the Collective Works team and the Small Wonder Festival for creating this wonderful event, the Creative Future team for pulling it all together, our host for tonight, Lem Sisse, and the guest performer, Ross Barber, and last but certainly not least, all the wonderful writers that entered the competition. Before I hand you over, 
I just want to say um, a little housekeeping. There are some feedback forms on your tables. It would really help us with um, getting future funding for these awards if you could fill these in. Just leave them on the tables and we'll gather them up after the event. Uh, the toilets are behind the, bar on the uh, barn on the left through the car park. And Lemon Ross will be available for signing books after the event, as I'm sure will the award winners. Yeah. <laughs> I'll now hand you over to the wonderful Lem. First up is Ros Barber, who will open with her poem, Thy Neighbour. Ros Barber's debut novel, The Marlowe Papers, won the Desmond Elliott Prize, as you've heard, uh, jointly won the Authors Club Best First Novel Award, as you've also heard, but which is incredible, uh, and was longlisted for the Women's Prize for Fiction 2013. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm round of applause for Ros Barber. Thank you and good evening. I was asked to, um, when I was asked to contribute a poem uh, to this anthology, and obviously I don't feel in any way marginalised, but there was a time in my life when I certainly was. And 15 years ago, I was a single parent with three boys in a two bedroom flat in Brighton going through a hostile divorce. I had one of my children in therapy, who was sort of seeing the child and adult mental health, child and adolescent mental health service. I had uh, massive money issues. And I was suffering from anxiety and depression. And in fact, I was suicidal. I chose a poem that hasn't been published from that time that I, I dug out. It, it, I didn't write it at the time. I wrote it some time afterwards trying to express the thing that was so difficult to express at the time about, uh, I suppose, operating, operating in society, trying to be normal. I, I actually was very frightened that my kids would be taken away. And uh, that, there was a huge issue with just going up to the school gate and having those conversations. And the school was very close to me. It was two minutes away. And this was kind of addressed to all of those mums who lived around me. Thy neighbour. I breathe like any ordinary fish, straining my gills. And my face is just like your face, only mute. And I wait for my children to emerge from school like any other parent, but a statue of secrets, afraid of the hunger, the tomb of my home. Not when visitors clack tongues over carpets tacked dumbly to the stairs or kids fray, but when they sleep when night extends far out from the curve of the earth, when wine turns blue on my tongue, then the tyranny of days. I wrestle with gravity to be up, to walk, to answer polite questions as if okay. Fill my basket with food I will lose all taste for alone while the urge to fall rolls like unlashed cargo inside my skull. This beautiful carcass you don't have to live in. These children you don't have to love through a famine. A home suspended between the dark and the dark. A name that only sounds like it means something. I've heard you. You say tomorrow as if it's inviting. Close your curtains. Turn to your soothing blue flickers, your meals for two, your comfortable silences. I am next door, my palms burning on rope, considering whether the drop would hurt less than a life amongst those not afraid of the dark. Thank you. 
Ross Barber. I'd like to introduce to you for the evening um, Ruth Ann Garrett, who is signing uh, for the evening, just so that you know everybody who's on stage at the moment, and the wonderful actor Mark Wilson, who will be reading W.J. Howard's Bettis, uh, the piece entitled uh, Next. Um, W.J. Howard Bettis has been writing for at least 10 years, fitting it in around family life. Her work mainly consists of short stories uh, following a supernatural theme. With a dark twist of humour added, she finds writing helps ease her depression and writes anywhere, including her GP's waiting room. Next. Come along, come along, I haven't got all day. Name, please. Sorry, I didn't quite catch that. Please speak up. Ah, yes, now, where am I? Dear me, these lists get longer every day. Ah, here you are. What? Oh, no, I'm afraid there's no mistake. You're definitely in the right place. Your name's here in black and white. Indeed, there's even an asterisk against it, which means, of course, that my master is very keen to meet you. A rather dubious honour, if you ask me, but there you are. Now, can you tell me what sins you committed? What? You didn't commit any? Oh, come, come, my dear fellow, of course you did. Why else would you be here? It says on my list that you committed suicide. Well, now, that's most unusual. We don't often get suicides down here. They tend to be allowed in upstairs nowadays. Between you and me, I think the old man up there is going a bit soft in the head. What? Oh, my dear man, I do apologize. I wish my colleagues would make these lists a little clearer. They know I have no spectacles. It's the heat, you know. They keep melting. Suicide bomber. Now that's more like it. What's that you say? Virgins? Where are the virgins? <laughs> you are a bright spark, aren't you? There are very few virgins down here, my man. And you won't be allowed to do anything anyway, apart from scream, of course. I'm afraid my colleague's already queuing up to do things to you. Oh, do stop snivelling. We've so much to do, endless things, and we haven't even started yet. Sue Kent grew up listening um, to poetry. She recited, uh, recited by her parents. She started writing at school, and for many years she wrote humorous rhyme for friends, but turned to more serious writing as she slowly lost her father to dementia. In 2009, she wrote her first piece acknowledging her disability. Sue Kent. Sparkling personality. I can walk into a room when it's rocking. Sound levels drop. They all stop talking. I can walk into a room when it's cooking. The pan stops boiling. Rude ones will start looking. I can walk into a room when it's in full groove. Rhythms will slow. I put the crowd back in the mood. It's not because I'm glamorous or because I'm blonde. I have a certain presence. I'm different from the throng. People who don't know me tell me that I'm great, asking personal questions. Do I have a car? Can I drive a car? Do I have a mate? Do you mind? How do you wipe your bum? Who paints your cute fingernails? Invasions halt my chance of fun. The pluses are the waiting staff, a body to remember. They treat me with a certain style, a celebrity list contender. Some party people turn their face away, the spark too bright to see. Open minds admire the lighting on display. Thank you. 
Uh, now, I need to say, I just need to ask this question. Can you all hear at the back? You can hear, otherwise you would have made a look like you couldn't. I just wanted to check, though. Can you, can you hear? No, you can't hear. Okay, so, so that's just a message for the sound uh, person and also for people who are coming up. Uh, just to sort of be aware of the mic, or is 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 that okay? Yeah. Um, you're at the front. You can't say. <laughs> no, I'm just, no, 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 okay. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I was just being cheeky. Um, are we good? Uh, sorry to sound. I didn't mean to say that. I, I, there's no other way I could have said it. I needed to check. Continue, Lem. Penny Pepper, the perfectly named poet. Penny Pepper, a long-time writer and an inclusive arts activist. I love that. Inclusive arts activist. Uh, faced years of discrimination for exploring disability in her genre-defying work. She wrote the taboo-breaking book, Desires, published 2003, reissued as an e-book, Desires Reborn, 2012. Currently completing her 80s memoir, first in the world, somewhere, and her unique novel, Fancy Nancy, the highly commended Penny Pepper. Okay, is that good? Okay. Uncle's gold pen. I stare. The pen is on the table. I haven't seen it for so many years. It glints as the sun dances through the window. My eyes are transfixed. Uncle's gold pen. A blackbird sings and I jolt back to myself. I click on my wheelchair and go closer. I dart my hand forward and the sun hits my skin. Sparks waltz around the pen, but I can't make myself touch it yet. Uncle wasn't a real uncle. He was mum's man friend. He visited when dad left, as he often did. Dad yelled hate, that we dragged him down, that I was the spaz kid. He should have got the bitch to abort. We enjoyed the quiet life when he was gone. My books came out from hiding the books he threatened to burn. Uncle Ray was a quiet man with dark hair and olive skin. Auntie said he was a foreigner. I didn't care. He spoke nicely, brought mum flowers which made her smile. Shame mum always forgave dad when he reappeared and the nightmares spun on. I remember the last time I saw Uncle Ray. He'd got wind of dad coming back and was retreating. I was impossibly sad. But he smiled and presented me with a pen. It was fat and gold and marvellous. A wand of magic in my unsteady hand. The words flew, sparks of fire. I wrote a poem, a story. Every day there were more until one day, a book on a shelf in a shop. The first of many. The pen went into a dusty drawer along with the memories of that gentle man. At last, I pick up the shining pen and notice a note underneath from my brother, Michael. It said, Hannah, I found Uncle Ray. Thank you. Penny Pepper.
Yeah, I was just thinking about how uh, how people uh, try, you know, everybody tries to write your story, how I had my story written for me by everybody else who had an idea of what the story of me should be and uh, were not uh, frightened to tell. Something about me uh, made them want to tell me what my story was. And uh, part of me being who I am is sort of know who we all are, in fact, is knowing our stories. And... Uh, it means that the things that we write are extremely real. Uh, it means that the imagination is a very real place. Um, I think, anyway. Um, Dolly Sen, uh, which is why this competition is absolutely incredible, the Marginalist Writers uh, Creative Literature uh, Future uh, Award. Um, Dolly Sen, uh, Dolly Sen, yeah, Dolly Sen, uh, was a film extra as a child working on The Empire Strikes Back as an alien child. She knew then she would never know what sanity is. As a writer, she has had eight books published, has won several awards for writing and blogs for various art and charity websites. Ladies and gentlemen, Lithium Sun by Dolly Sen. Lithium Sun. You say my sun shines too bright, but if you had the dark clouds I've had, you could give nothing less. Yes, sometimes the sun blinds others, but with it, I just, can, just about can see where I'm going. You can turn off the light if you want. You have the power. You can give me back the dark room. But once in there, you ask me to leave that too. 1,000 watt or nothingness is me, I guess. You can for force the 50 watt on me, but it doesn't fit the slot. I have tried pushing it in. My soul is torn to prove it. Until you change your light into one that fits, one that shines and doesn't laugh at dreams. Let me shine my way until I can see where I'm going and the sun can rest behind the trees. Thank you. A never a more perfectly timed poem as autumn approaches, Dolly. Um, Jared McGuinness uh, is an American living in London. He's the co-founder of the Literary Variety Night, The Special Relationship. He's wicked to mock the afflicted.com. In addition to writing fiction, he holds a PhD in artificial intelligence. It's true, ladies and gentlemen, Jared McGuinness. Great. Can you hear me all right? Yeah, that's good. Okay. I was only slightly disappointed that it was a, the, the winnings were a check because I didn't bring any cash and I, they wouldn't take my check at the bar. So <laughs> just a note for future events. <laughs> they pull into her drive. James thought about the front steps. Not many first dates start with looking in your date's dark eyes while her mother and father struggle to drag you up into the house. There would also be narrow doors and tight corners asking her, are you sure? There are other boys, undamaged, who could fall in love with you. He sat embarrassed as she pulled his wheelchair out of the, that, out of the boot, clunk. She was slotting a wheel into place, clunk. He wanted to go home. We'll go through the back garden, she said. Behind the house, there was a long wooden ramp. James was as relieved as he was confused. Inside, the air held the promise of Sunday roast. This is my brother Elias's room, she knocked. Sara! The man in the hospital bed had eyes made of the same dark, polished stone. They sparkled to life, seeing his sister. A cabinet-sized dialysis machine of tubes and buttons, a 1970s uh, vision of the future, sat beside the bed. Sara, Elias, Elias, this is James. James, Elias's tremoring arms pulled him closer. James hugged the shirtless man, felt the thin flesh stretched across sharp scapula, the knotted rope of vertebrae and ribs, the feverish heat. A heavy skull rested on James's shoulder. 
James fought a flood of emotions, unsure of the meaning. Can I get you anything? Sarah asked. Elias pointed to a small radio. In the dining room, her mother and father were setting the table. Eli from Elias's room came a screech. James looked at Sarah, afraid something was wrong. And they were all smiling. Mother, father, sister. He's singing to the radio, she explained. Their ears pointed toward the off-key warbling in the other room, all smiling. Nothing was wrong. Nothing was wrong at all. Thank you. Lynn E. Blackwood uh, is an Anglo-Indian, almost has-bound writer who began writing in April 2012. Her work's drawn from little life rich in emotions. Lynn, where are you? Events and people, come on. <laughs> she has met. I, I, will, I will talk while you walk, okay? Lynn, Lynn writes poetry, short stories, novels that are sensitive, mosaic of emotions and cultures. Ladies and gentlemen, Lynn E. Perfectly Timed, Wonderful Blackwood. Right. Can you hear me well at the back there? Yeah, bring it down a bit. Is that better? Yeah, thank you for coming. I'm a bit blind, so if I falter, it's because I can't see the words. Follow your judgment. When the coarse jute noose tightened Samuel's throat, specks danced behind his eyes like fire sparks. The lynch mob swayed before his vision, their angry sweat stinging his senses as he dangled, toes outstretched to the half-open trapdoor. It hadn't functioned correctly and was now jammed at an angle. Samuel had placed his feet to one side in a convulsive reflex to save his life. He now twisted and turned in a rhythmic motion on his outstretched toes, knees extended painfully, bare skin glued to wood in a last death-cheating effort. At each sway, the rope dug deeper into his leathery neck, throttling the breath out of him as the disappointed crowd bayed from the market square. Roman candles now burst behind his bulging globes, sparks turned into light flashes. Samuel was gasping, his deformed body writhing like a court eel on the end of the outstretched rope. His lungs burned as excruciating pain slowly extinguished his life breath. A pungent odour of mucky straw soiled with animal comings and goings filled his nostrils as his feet finally slipped. Exhaling a last, choking gasp, the twisted body convulsed in final death throes. He heard from afar in a distant consciousness. Child murderer, good riddance. The lynch mob fell silent as Samuel's body finally hung still. Blue-faced, tongue and eyes bulging, the last spark of his miserable life dampened out by ignorant hate. The silence of a satiated crowd was broken now by whispers that rippled through the market square, rising in crescendo to a noisy hubbub. They found the real murderer. A deafening silence of many thoughts, heavy with realisation, fell like molten lead as villagers bowed heads with sudden shame. The mob slowly dispersed. Daily activities called. Samuel, the village outcast, hadn't murdered Letty Blackman after all. Thank you.
Deborah Beecher, Finding the Source. Deborah Beecher has written poetry sporadically all her adult life, and uh, I love that, uh, and attended several creative writing groups. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, please give a warm round of Why is it when you're in the audience, you say, ladies and gentlemen, you never say that in any other environment. Anyway, this is the first time she's won an award. Give her a round of applause, Deborah Beecher. Finding the Source. I sit cupped by the hands of the room. You coax a tiny spark. Gentle as moss, your breath blows, softly fans the flame. To me, you seem patient as Sisyphus. You sit quietly by the fire, encourage, with a question, clarify my meaning. The spark flames, pure hot white. Between sessions, I flicker in winds of perceived social pressure. A guttering candle, I build up fat like wax, afraid they'll stamp my fire, snuff me out. Each week, our minds clash, flint striking sparks. You catch the flame, teach me to bank my fire, burn with truth, a knowledge that slides like water off the modern earth. Months later, I'm ablaze with talking. See how I kindle myself. Your constant hearth has rendered me a burning bush unquenchably alive. Thank you. So Alistair Watt um, is going to be read by Mark Wilson. Uh, Alistair recently joined his local writing group and has found them very encouraging. He's constantly thinking of plots and makes hard copy as and when life uh, doesn't get in the way. Just a Spark is his first published work since becoming a born-again writer. It's always the same. Right when you're in the middle of doing something, somebody comes to the door. The knocking grew frantically louder, and I didn't want my neighbours calling the cops, so I wiped myself down with a towel and put on my bathrobe. Opening the door was like seeing myself in a mirror. His face looked very like mine. He bundled his way in through my confusion and went straight into the living room. To cut a long story short, he explained that he was me, from a parallel world. He'd slipped sideways along one of time's dimensions and I'd have to swap places with him right away so the universe didn't implode into singularity. For an instant, I was just a spark in a universe of infinite possibilities. Then in no time at all, I was materialising in his space-time. I wondered what his reaction would be to my wife's partly dismembered body in the bath. Most likely it was the same as mine when I discovered what was, in all probability, his wife's bloody corpse lying on the living room floor. Uh, Kathy Bryant uh, only started submitting her poems to prove to her friend who get off stage now, Lem. Quick, run, <laughs> run for the hills. Uh, Kathy Bryant only started submitting her poems. Do you like my theatre work there? Do you like that? <laughs> Kathy Bryant only started submitting her poems to prove to her friend who kept nagging her to submit that no one would publish them. Uh, Mark Wilson uh, is going to read from her first collection, published recently. Some facet of brakes or wheels strikes sparks from the cobbles and the boy whoops and laughs as his mother bumps the wheelchair along. Like a fairground ride, she beams at me and I smile back, doing my crutches waltz over the uneven stones, each unique like faces or fingerprints and the gentle moss between. The sound and feel of crutch and feet clack thud on the cobbles. Silent softness on moss, transmitted up to my arms. The wheelchair sounds like a zip wire or train. A girl, about six, is being dragged along by her mother, her little legs reluctant. She looks at the wheeling, laughing boy in his sparking chariot and tugs at her mother's hand. Mum, look, Mum, see that? I want one. I want one. Uh, 
uh, Nicola Wood is going to read Immortal Poem. Nic Nicola, you can come up now. Um, he's going to read uh, Immortal... Uh, um, yeah, Immortal. Uh, Nicola's been a poet since she was eight years of age, uh, inspired by many things, including astrology, uh, nature, the spiritual. She's a background in drama, in acting, performing her own work on many occasions. Nicola. Thank you very much. Can everybody hear me? Yes. yes? Um, I just want to say this poem was inspired by a mythic tarot card that I saw, uh, a Pandora opening the box, and the card is actually the star, which I thought was very appropriate. So here it is. You just had to open that box, Pandora. There was no stopping you. Bored and petulant, spoiled, a darling of the gods. All those bitter poisons all over the earth with night on their wings. Depression's cloud making the blood run gray. Illness in the body's frail machinery. Circuits in need of repair. Loneliness creating all those Eleanor Rigby's in their silently private rooms. Like gifts or invitations unopened, dreading the sting of another dawn. Were you surprised, Pandora, that something of the human spirit remained, locked away with all those dusty, cobweb things? When those light bulb muses in their neon colors switched on inspiration, did it hurt your eyes? Refusing to be lost, the soul nurtures a firefly glow, that hint of gold behind the eyes which touches the angelic, the magician in us all. So, despite your box of dirty tricks, Pandora, here it is, a star made of titanium. This brave, small candle flame inside, our always son at heart, our child at play in springtime, dancing with butterflies. Peter Jordan is going to read Contact. Peter Jordan be, began writing as part of his recovery. Uh, Peter, uh, you can come up. Uh, thanks, man. Uh, from having a, a golf ball-sized tumour removed from his brain. He then took an MA in creative writing. He's now taking a PhD in short fiction, despite having recently been diagnosed with dyslex dyslexia. Peter Jordan. Thanks very much. Uh, bear with me here. Uh, I wasn't going to say this, but I think I will. Um, this, uh, I wrote this story. Um, I was living in Los Angeles in 1988, and uh, I had trouble leaving the house. Um, I was suffering from agoraphobia. I think I was, I was smoking too many funny cigarettes at the time as well, probably. But um, it literally took an earthquake to get me out of the house. So this, was, this is contact. Jake knew it was going to happen a full minute before it happened. He sat in his haunches, his ears half raised. Then he barked, and he kept barking. The floor was moving. The whole room was moving. Things were falling. Jake tore up a mystery th thriller which had fallen from the bookshelf, and then it was over. I walked outside. The street was full of people. No one said anything. The woman from across the street was standing outside our gate. She walked over and offered me a cigarette. It was a menthol, but I took it anyway. Jake sat behind the fly screen watching. Then he started barking. It's okay, Jake, I said. There'll probably be an aftershock, she said. I'd wait until it's over before going back inside. I've never experienced an earthquake before, I said. That one was big, she said, but the one in my day, it was bigger. She drew in her cigarette. Before it happens, when you think back, there's pure silence. The air is very still. I thought about that. She was right. I'm Imelda, she said. Imelda, I'm Elliot. Pleased to meet you, I said. Likewise. Jake started barking again. I looked up at him. He ran around the living room in circles, bouncing off things the way he used to when I'd first got him. I think he's jealous, said Imelda. Then came the aftershock. I held Imelda. Imelda held me. It was a rush. I had an image of the street opening up 
and both of us falling into the fault line, but it was over quicker than the first one. Imelda let me go. You'd better go back inside and calm the dog, she said. Yeah, I said, yeah. Laura Thornley. Laura Thornley's just completed a creative writing course as part of the Open University degree with a... Sorry. Sorry. No, go on. Okay. Okay. <laughs> with the support of her family, uh, she devotes all her spare time to writing poetry. Uh, Laura Thornley will be read by Mark Wilson. Wet faces staring, strangers all-knowing freaks taunting with my memories, speaking solid facts that break into fragments and float into my ears on a condescending tone, a stomach-churning tone. I want to scream my denial, a multitude of questions with a ladle full of doubt. Have they stolen my recognition? Have they gnawed away my thoughts? Or did a parallel universe swallow me up in time, spitting me out in this white metal dream, where I stand, where they stare, where they wait for the synapse, wait for the spark. Will it spark? David Payton. David, uh, David Payton, the little bang please, um, has suffered from mental health difficulties for about 20 years. He's written poems and lyrics during his, this period as a way of gathering his thoughts. The Little Bang. Uh, the Little Bang. A trace of bloodshed on my hands. I share my father's dopey eyes. I'm certified politely mad, but sadly I just can't quite cry. A twinkle in my mother's womb, I hope that when I die I'll know. Until then I shall nurse my wounds, a spark begat ex nihilo. The alpha and the omega, a walnut being opened in the manner of a Mobius, the calling of another zone. Uh, uh. Excuse me, um, Anne Oatley, uh, please, uh, read in Boston. Anne Oatley lives in South London. She's a full-time carer for her mother who has dementia. She has tried her hand at long and short fiction, drafting everything in pen before typing it up on her ancient desktop. <laughs> go, my brother screams, go! Go where, I wonder, but bullets are flying past. Away, I guess. I'm still processing bro firing the gun and the cop lying straight down like a movie. I can see my face in the SUV's mirror, eyes like window panes and a smoky smear on my cheek. Least I don't look like a pretty boy fag no more. Sirens well behind us and we're speeding through ripples of blue light because a spark jumped an inch of darkness and made us guilty. If I drive fast enough, maybe we'll shoot into another dimension, a bubble where nothing happens just because something else did. Bro watched it over and over on TV. The first few times, my brain expanded like that dirty cloud bulging over the street, people stopping to look, taking a second to figure out they should run. Bro was bouncing round, yelling, Death to the Kafar! He gets that Arab shit off weird stuff he sees on YouTube. I smoke my weed. Bystanders twisted in a metal fence, like someone screwed them up and threw them away. TV was talking about arms and legs getting blown off, and that put pictures in my mind. It kept on. The sunshine and the moment everything stopped being normal forever and the cloud rose again. The 15th time I saw it, I felt empty. A freaking manure factory in Texas did more damage than we did. No place to go but on. Bro leans out the window and throws something. 
It booms and the night turns orange, but I don't even twitch. Or a dog running from a tin can tied to its own tail. Somewhere that cloud is rising for the hundredth time. And it wasn't worth it, wasn't worth it, wasn't worth jack shit. Dolly Sen. Dolly Sen. Uh, this is the second time we're hearing from Dolly, uh, who's won two prizes. Uh, this will be Light Bulbs, the poem. Dolly Sen. Don't worry, it's a short one. A thousand stars fall to earth to be buried in little star coffins that nobody mourns. Instead, they wish upon light bulbs. Told you. <laughs> light bulbs! Yes! It's like six of them, a hat with like five of them. Everywhere I go, I wake up in the morning now as autumn comes and just light bulbs. It's like, uh, Tom Jason, Lifebird. Tom, where are you? Tom? Fantastic. Go on, go on, go on, go on. Come on, come on. Tom Jaston spent several years struggling with depression before attempting to mitigate this circumstance with illicit narcotics. Unsurprisingly, this was unsuccessful. Tom wrote about the situation he found himself in, homelessness, criminality, prison and violence, but also the kindness, love and the humanity he found there. Uh, Lifebird. I am peering at my moon-weary face in an isosceles shard of mirror that seems more suited to stabbing a man in the throat than as an aid to shaving, and I do not smile. The razor makes an effort, attempting to circumvent its bluntness by engaging in a tug-of-war with each crusty, beer-gilded hair. In the mirror weapon, I see myself wince as the clumps are yanked from the follicles, the sharp early morning air does not help, but I finish and roll a cigarette. Anne told me that today might be the beginning of a new life for me. If new lives begin like this, she can shove it. The clock on the church in the cemetery where I sleep says 5.50 a.m. My cigarette tastes bad, so I flick the ember and twirl the butt in my fingers. Very little to do, but wait. The interview is at 9.45. I remind myself that not all housing officers are cunts. <laughs> a jay hops and jitters towards the grave of Captain Ninian Masters on my left, and I'm tempted to rifle a fag butt at it, but I remember from an age ago that corvids have a theory of mind, according to some researchers, so I keep twirling and watch. After a couple of seconds, the jay flies a few feet and settles on Ninian Masters' headstone. Bloody disgrace, I think, for this headstone is mine, literally. I use it as a pillow and as a windbreak. The jay is unaware of my absurd resentment, according to some other researchers, and remains still, looking hard at my freshly shaved countenance. Maybe it sees something that I do not, a different me. I grin. Ninian Masters belongs to the J now. I have things to do. Sue Kent. This is the second time we're hearing from Sue. Sparks fly. As a novice at this, I'll try and get the microphone technique now. I've been given a second time to try. Sparks fly. Your gaze fills our separated space. Crowded place. Blush of roses light my face. Home. Thoughts reflect out to me. I see guarded emotional security. Contained. Windows to your truth, drop close. I am alone and watch you doze. 
upstairs, the way your eyes caress my legs in bed, plays havoc with my head. Maybe we should wear dark glasses as time passes. Tracy Watkins is a painter, sculptor, who is both influenced and inspired by her physical and mental disabilities. Wasp is Tracy's first published piece of writing. Mark Watson. Wilson. <laughs> Wilson, yeah. I was told today that I had lost my spark, and at first I laughed because I had only been half listening to the conversation. But later, whilst on the train home, I caught sight of my reflection with its pale skin and dark, haunted eyes, and I realized what she had really meant. And the barb pierced swift and deep, like the stinger of the wasp that had once chased me down the wooden pier at Western Supermare when I was five. And Mum said, don't scream so loudly, it isn't ladylike. Hush now, everyone is looking at you. But then she started to shout even louder than me because she saw that in all that running and waving my arms around like a windmill had made me drop ice cream mixed with blood red sauce onto my brand new cardigan which was white with shiny pearl buttons to match my brand new socks and cherry blossom leather sandals. And then she began to drag me by the arm into the ladies and I squirmed and bawled and screamed so hard that a mixture of snot and tears began to run down my face. And it was then that I decided that when I grew up, I would never let anyone make me feel as bad again. And yet here I am, many years later, and not for the first time, with hot, angry tears streaming down my face. And I noticed that some have trickled down the end of my nose and splashed onto the front of my best suede coat, leaving deep, dark rings. But at least this time, I have a paper hanky in which to blow my nose. Thank you. Sarah Walker. Um, Sarah? Uh, thank you. Uh, Sarah Walker was born uh, in 1961. The reason I'm saying people's names as they walk, I think it's quite beautiful. Uh, but I also, it also means that you're not just, when people are applauding, come, keep, go, keep coming uh, in London. She's a mother of two children. Writing and making pictures is an essential way for her to explore her feelings, surroundings, and family history. Um, this poem is called My Father. My dearest father spews out bitter words to me. His anger has completely engulfed him so that he is tiny and small within it. He says, she lost all rights when she left her marital home. She talks with a quiet voice, but really she is bad and wrong. She has everything, how contemptible. Surely this meeting is over. One minute. He recalls himself as a small boy, terrified of abandonment. The next, he is spewing out bitter, angry words. He tells a story of music and friendship far away in Palestine. I remember his dark silences during my years of growing up. He says, just a minute. I too want to speak about my life. I must speak. I have no brothers or sisters to corroborate my story, so I must speak alone. Otherwise, my story will be lost. Thank you. Maurice Sanders uh, is going to read now. Read the spark. Maurice Sanders, encouraged by her mum, entered a writing competition when she was five. The prizes were blow football sets for boys, sewing sets for girls, and to her surprise, she won a blow football set and has been writing ever since. <laughs> the spark. 
I saw the whole of the universe erupt when I was seven and three quarters. I still see the electric blues and vivid greens and some colours I'd never seen before. The shapes and the sounds and the smells have seared themselves into my memory. The stars and the whirls and the roars and the eye-watering, nostril-scorching stench of it and the metal taste of fear. We all saw it during the annual village party. This was held at Harold Carter's because he had the longest garden that, which ran the entire length of the memorial hall. After dark, we'd troop through his house and out the back. Leaving our parents by the house, we'd file up the dim aisle of hunched brassicas and skeletal bean sticks to where Harold Carter stood, a solitary figure waiting to receive our offerings, which we laid reverently on the flat lid of an old tin trunk. We'd retreat quickly to our parents to watch the shadowy figure of Harold bobbing and bowing over our gifts, arranging them in order in the trunk. This was tradition. We knew what to expect. Whoosh! The first rocket! jumped from the ground and powered its wiggling way up and up before stretching into an explosion of coloured stars that fell to earth, lighting upturned faces and open mouths, and Harold still fussing over the trunk. Then the unexpected happened. Suddenly, the universe was created from that old tin box the world was alight with shapes and sounds. We trembled at its power, and in the lurid light, we saw Harold sprawled in obeisance by the open lid. I was seven and three quarters when I stared at the shrieking jaws of hell and saw the stretching hands of heaven and the spark that started the universe. Um, so the spark that started the universe uh, ends the evening. Uh, just to say thank you very much to yourself, Ruth Ann, uh, and, and a special, yeah, absolutely. He's been working, doing the whole gig. You've rocked the whole gig. There's been poetry in your movement, and uh, it's reflected in the poems and the short stories, and uh, it makes me want to say things like burst. Burst. <laughs> Wonderful. And uh, to say to Mark Wilson, uh, those were beautiful readings of that text, Mark. Uh, beautiful. The poems could not, and short stories could not have been exalted, is that the right word, um, uh, as better than, 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 than your reading. As one who reads and who loves reading, it was a joy. Thank you. Very Thank much. you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, and I also saw the notes you made. Yeah. I saw this beautiful pattern of notes on the words. Uh, beautiful. Ladies and gentlemen, I will shut up. My name's Lem Sissé. This has been the first of many, of many of those, the Creative Future Literature Awards. Come on. Come on. People are going to be talking about this. Hey, how can I beat that? What an inspirational, fantastic evening. Lem, thank you. Ruthann, thank you. Writers, thank you. You've been absolutely inspirational, thought-provoking, powerful, compelling voices. You really deserve to be heard. I hope the book's a great success, and I hope you all have the success you richly deserve. Thank you. It's been a really inspirational evening, and it's been a great privilege for us to be have you here? By the book. Yeah, buy the book. It's here, City Books. Buy it as a gift. It's here. Inga and the team at City Books would be delighted to help you. So um, please enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you so much for coming here. And I hope this is the start of something really fantastic. Thank you. Thank you.